Ducklings, today's video is sponsored by Skillshare. I am very privileged to be able to say as much and I can't wait to let you know a little bit more about that platform later on. There are certain points in your life as a spiritual practitioner when you realise profoundly that all the things you've been doing, reading about, experimenting with and believing in have been providing deep training for something awful that you have to survive. Every time you engage in meditation, scrying, devotional work, ritual, spellcraft, record keeping, reading, connecting with nature, hitting that yoga mat or seeking answers through divination, you are placing a brick into a structure that will one day give you shelter as you face a desperately tough thing. When that difficult time arrives, whether it's a bereavement, a job loss, an experience of abuse, a painful breakup, a shocking betrayal, or a flare up of physical or mental health symptoms, you somehow feel like you've been training for this crucial moment. The most potent and stabilizing parts of your practice suddenly they're some of your sharpest tools. You may not feel able to pick them up, but it doesn't matter, you have been picking them up and they have helped you create a foundation of strength that will see you through to the other side. When you can't practice for a while, you'll be glad you did when you could. You may not feel able to actually continue to practice through the tough experience you're having, especially if your time is taken up caring for your own immediate needs or for someone else's. You may even tell yourself spiritual practice is pointless or would cause more pain. But all the work you did before, leading up to the terrible circumstance, really counts for something. In other words, your practice puts you into a much better position to be able to handle whatever scary situation may soon unfold. For me, during this time when I'm deeply bereaved, I've been presented with a luminous opportunity to appreciate my practice. It's hard to get my head around how truly supportive this aspect of my life has been. I don't need to immediately go back to daily work at my altar or plan any big sumptuous rituals. For me, it's not quite the right time for that yet. But I already feel fed and held by my beliefs and practices. I know the goddess is there. I know I can just hold my prayer beads. I know I can consider the spiritual texts that I've read and recite words of power that have always had a fortifying effect on me. That has made a universe of difference. Over the years of being a spiritual counsellor, talking with witches and mystics of every stripe, I've had many conversations with practitioners about whether or not their belief structure is true. Is it real? Does it hold any value? Can it ever be proved? Is it just something they've made up to make themselves feel better? And if it can't be proved, and if it's just a way to manage earthly pain or make life more interesting, what does that mean? Is that even okay? Is it just an unhealthy delusion? These riveting conversations often lead to a similar kind of place. It's a place where the practitioner must ask themselves, is there any proof that their practice is helpful to them? Has it eased their pain? Has it made them feel more connected? Help them to manage their unhealthy habits or destructive behaviors? Has it helped them work through their trauma? Has it helped them feel able to manage the weird burden of consciousness? If their answer to these questions is yes, that's the proof that means something. We have to drop our desire to be able to explain with logic what we approach with deep feeling, feeling that goes beyond the language it would take to define it. We have to lessen our concerns about what others would think if we had to justify our beliefs in an essay or a speech, because here's the beautiful thing, sweethearts, we don't need to do that. Your spirituality is your thing. There is no burden upon you to justify your deep sense of what you are called to do spiritually. I could write an essay on why I consider Joan of Arc to be a spiritual guide, or why tarot is a healing tool for mankind, or how it's possible that I work with Mother Mary, but not Jesus Christ. Ultimately though, I relinquish my responsibility to do that just to appease other people or make myself feel more valid in my beliefs. Instead, 
I take note of how my beliefs and practices spread salve over my wounds, guide me out of seemingly impossible darkness, and bring me back to the strength in the core of my beingness, which is divine all by itself. Let yourself have what is calling to you. If you hold your practice now, it will hold you when nothing else can. That doesn't mean you have to do it every day, and it doesn't mean you always need to do the same thing each time. It certainly doesn't mean that you need all the stuff that some practitioners have. I'm just using my altars and cards as a backdrop while I'm talking, but I don't believe these things make me a witch. I'm just as much a witch when I'm outside watching the sunrise as I am when it's midnight and I'm sitting at my altar. Start where you are, bloom where you're planted. I know these things are cliches, but sometimes we need this reminder. If you need this reminder right now, just close your eyes and take a couple of relaxed breaths. And now say, I choose to start where I am. I choose to bloom where I'm planted. Hello, my delectable Pop-Tarts. Thank you so much for joining me. Today, I'm going to be talking a little bit about consistency in spiritual practice. Um, in my line of work, this is a conversation that I have had countless times and every conversation has been different. Um, there are some things that each conversation shares in common, which is how I've come to understand a lot of the things that I'm going to put forth to you in this video is just by having these conversations very frequently and having them with people all over the world with different kinds of practices and sort of different nuances to their issues. But there are some things that I have found to be the main points I would I would venture to talk about when it comes to are you dropping your practice? Are you being inconsistent? Do you set up these really great ideas of what you're going to do and then never do them? If so, this is the video for you. I'm going to break down a few of the reasons why that might be, things that you can do to actually deal with this issue if you want a consistent spiritual practice. Uh, so let's get into it. There's going to be a little bit of tough love in here. There's going to be a bit of honesty in here. And I think I'm going to really enjoy going through these points. So as always, there are timestamps below. You will not find timestamps for my older videos. I'm sorry, darlings. I'm not going to go back and rewatch all of my older videos and put timestamps in. But I will do my level better to put timestamps in now that they are possible and available. Okay, so you'll find the timestamps below if you want to skip through anything that isn't of interest to you or isn't relevant, you can find the information that you think is going to be helpful to you. First of all, first thing it is I want to say is you are not alone. If you're watching this because you struggle with consistency and you keep making grand plans for things you're going to do in your spiritual practice and then you fall off the wagon really quickly, you might go strong for a week or two and then it just doesn't happen or you might plan it, plan it, plan it, plan it, and then it never comes to fruition. You're far from being alone. There are lots of people that are wondering why it is that they can't just factor their spirituality in once a day or even just a couple of times a week or whatever it might be. So don't worry, you know, you're in very good company. You'll probably find lots of people in the comments that have similar kinds of issues. And I myself have had similar kinds of issues at different points in my life. So I want to say that first of all, there's nothing wrong with you. It doesn't mean that you're not a witch or you're not a mystic or you're not spiritual, but there probably are some things that you can look at if you want to have a more consistent spiritual practice and you want to factor it in and you're finding that you haven't been factoring it in there are definitely some things that I think you can look at so I'm going to try to give you some of those tips and ideas now the first thing I want to say first tip that I can give you is ask yourself have you really stopped your spiritual practice or has it just morphed into something else Sometimes we're not always supposed to be working at our altars or filling in a book of shadows or even going to the yoga mat. Sometimes it, it is the case that what you are doing to invest your spiritual energy out into the world has changed because of circumstances, because of where you are in your life. For example, you might be bringing a lot of spirituality to the pottery lessons that you're teaching or your sibling's children that you are looking after every afternoon because your sibling is having a bad time right now. Or, you know, you might be bringing a lot of spirituality to your work or to your friendships and you might find that you're actually kind of shooting your spiritual load, sorry to be crude, um, but you're doing that in a different way. And no, it doesn't look 
you know, textbook spiritual. You're not sat there at an altar space with your candles lit and your incense burning. You're not chanting necessarily. You're not doing anything that somebody could walk in on you and see immediately is spiritual. But that does not mean that it's not a spiritual practice. And maybe for the time being, at least, you have migrated over to actually concentrating a lot of your spiritual practice, your spiritual energy, your strong spiritual intention into this other thing that on the surface doesn't look spiritual, but you know that it is and you feel distinctly that it is, you know? When I go to festival season, when I go and do a whole festival season and I go to two or three festivals in that season, no, I don't have, I don't carry a temporary altar with me. I don't chant. I don't connect with goddess. I'm busy like cutting up dance floors with my rude shapes. Um, but do I think that's a spiritual thing? Yeah, I definitely think that's part of my spiritual practice. And, um, you know, there are certain things when I'm incredibly depressed and I don't feel I can get to the altar every day that I do that I think are very spiritual, like taking myself out for a walk or hydrating myself properly. That to me then is my spiritual practice, the practice of keeping myself as alive and healthy as I can through the darkest of times. And I actually convert my mindset so that it aligns with that rather than thinking, oh, my God, I haven't I don't even know what moon phase it is. I haven't even, you know, done a devotional to my goddess in three weeks. It's like, OK, but maybe that's not where the spiritual focus and the spiritual energy is supposed to be going right now. Maybe you are indeed investing it down the avenue it most needs to be invested down. So take a moment to think about that. Is it possible that your spirituality looks rather different um, and you are practicing it but it's not something as I said that someone could instantly identify as spiritual but that doesn't matter you know that really doesn't matter let's say that you are in the beginning stages of starting a business and it's taking up a lot of time and energy you're doing a lot of research you're figuring out the finances you know maybe you're collaborating with people maybe you're putting the website together and you feel that that is taking a lot of your energy. And as a result, you're not going to the altar every day. You're not doing your daily draw. You're not doing your meditation or whatever it is you normally would consider to be your spiritual practice. How can you begin to recognize that building a business for yourself is a spiritual practice that you are aligned with at this moment in time? It might be that you want to say words of power before you open your laptop and start working on business ideas. It might be that you want to wear power jewelry that you only wear, consecrated jewelry that you only wear when you are, um, you know, planning your business and all that kind of thing when you are in that mode so that you recognize it as a spiritual practice. I think expanding our definition of what spiritual practice is creates a lot less room for guilt. And I don't think that guilt and that shame and that feeling of failure is very useful or fair on us when actually sometimes we feel incredibly spiritual about the thing that we are doing. You know, if you are a full time carer and you're berating yourself for not getting to your altar because you're busy caring for your for your unwell parent or loved one or partner. Um, I, I can't stand the thought that you would be berating yourself for not being able to sit at your altar. You are doing something so sacred, so spiritual, um, such a deep, deep experience of learning and giving and being present don't ever tell yourself that isn't a spiritual practice. I hope I'm making sense. You know what I mean? Like we need to be expanding that definition sometimes. Otherwise it just breeds this guilt and this feeling that we are not the spiritual person we want to be. And that that is very often not the case. Um, spiritual practice comes in in all, all shapes and all acts. There are so many acts that are deeply, deeply spiritual. Let's start to expand our sense of what it means to be spiritual. It's not just sitting around at the altar doing those things, which of course are so potent and so extraordinary and feel so important, but we cannot always be operating like that. And that is okay. I know this is something that I've said on the channel before, darlings, but actually I think that a lot of people question for themselves whether or not they should do something creative with their free time or spiritual with their free time. And that's something that really bothers them. And actually, I think we can just fuse those things together. 
we can find the overlap, we can find that part of the Venn diagram where your creativity is your spirituality. It's the same if you own an allotment and you think, oh, I really want to go and do the allotment or I want to do the garden, I want to get out there, but I also feel like I need to sit at my altar and I need to recognise my goddess and stuff. Dedicate your allotment efforts to your goddess and go and do that stuff. That is beautiful. That is part of spirituality. There is no sense that you've lost anything by having to choose one thing or the other. Um, I, I've said before a few times, I think, that I dedicate all my workouts to my goddess. So to me, that was very useful for me because it made my workout routine into a spiritual practice. And I really needed that um, because otherwise I would have felt like, oh, I have to choose between altar work and spiritual practice. Uh, well, I have to choose between altar work and going to the gym today. I don't have time for everything. Whereas now I think of it as like the ultimate honoring it's an offering to my goddess my sweat is my offering so there's ways that you can find yourself recognizing less orthodox less normalized spiritual practices if we can call anything that we do normalized darlings um and actually saying this is a spiritual practice for me so see what you can bring in see how you can expand that definition the second point that i want to make for those who feel like their practice is inconsistent and they're feeling frustrated with themselves is do you need to update your practice? Has it been a while since you really examined it and looked at what works for you and what doesn't work for you anymore? What isn't cutting the mustard anymore? And it could be something that you used to swear by as one of the absolute foundations of your practice, but we change. We change, we evolve, uh, we need different things depending on what's going on in our life journey. Nothing wrong with that. So sometimes you might find you still want to meditate, but you don't want to meditate the same way. Maybe you always focused on the breath in silence, but now you want guided meditation, binaural beats, group meditation, you know. Uh, maybe you used to do a lot of ritual and maybe that doesn't jibe with you anymore. Maybe you used to be very spellcraft oriented, but for some reason now you feel more called to just uh, work on your tarot stuff or, you know, do work in the community. You know, people change. Um, and as we change our spiritual path is permitted to evolve with us. So ask yourself if you're hanging on to any sort of dead weight in the practice department, something that could be replaced now with something a little bit more sparkly and interesting. There's nothing wrong with that. And I think sometimes when it comes to beings, I know certainly when I work with clients, we sometimes have discussions about beings that seem to be moving away from um, from a practitioner and that can feel difficult. There is a process that you need to go through about potentially letting go of a being that doesn't seem as as present anymore. That's definitely difficult. Um, and there are a few more steps to that for definite that I think I'll go into in another video. But when it comes to practices, when it comes to the structure of your spiritual path, um, you are allowed to change that. You are permitted to change that. It's very normal not to feel particularly enticed towards a path that is filled with things that are kind of like relics, you know? They're artifacts from a previous version of yourself. And if you know that you have actually kind of shed a skin psycho-spiritually, then perhaps your path needs to be altered and, and shaped and customised accordingly to fit with what you've been through, to help you to express this new lens that you're looking at things through. And there really is nothing wrong with that, nothing to feel guilty about in that. And it can actually be quite fun. It can be fun to sit down and brainstorm. Actually, what has it been a while since I really um, found any, any aid from? What are the things in my practice that I... I feel bored by even before I've started them. And is it time to shake things up? Maybe you don't want to completely get rid of that practice, but you want to alter the um, the aspects of it. You know, so like I mentioned with meditation, there's so many different ways to meditate. There's so many different ways to keep records of your spells and rituals. There's so many different ways to do ritual. So perhaps you are just stuck in the mud. You're stuck trying to um, continue on with something that doesn't reflect you anymore. So definitely ask yourself, do I need an update? Are there a few things here that could be replaced with something that is more exciting and more relevant to who I am now? My third tip for you, my darlings, is do you need to simplify your practice? You do not need to simplify it permanently. It may just require a little temporary simmer down. 
you know i know that for me this is something that has been a problem sometimes my practice gets too flowery there is too much going on there is too much that i'm reading there are too many plans that i'm making and i actually just need to go right back to the basics just strip it right back and really for me that would be just lighting a candle in the morning and just you know having some thoughts of gratitude or speaking some affirmations just really making it super super simple um usually there is a build up for me in terms of how flowery and how and how over the top it's getting and how multi-layered it's become and then suddenly I'm like, okay, we need to reel it in, you know, especially I, I find this is true with people who study a lot of different things or get a lot of different certifications in the spiritual realm. Uh, sometimes it can just be so, so tempting to grab everything from the shelf and really to just take on too much and be learning too much or be learning, you know, tarot and runes and astrology and, and herbalism and actually really sort of boiling your brain a little bit, essentially. And, you know, in my book, Rebel Witch, I refer to that as mystical magpie syndrome. So I'm going to read you out a little excerpt from the book now so we can all be clear on what mystical magpie syndrome is so that you know whether or not you might have it right now and whether that might be stopping you, freezing you a little bit from practicing. Mystical magpie syndrome. Rebel witches are spoilt for choice. There's so much out there to discover and experiment with, and we give ourselves permission to try it all. Like a kid in a sweet shop doesn't even begin to cover how it feels to be a witch, sizing up all the different techniques and tools on offer. Like mystical magpies, many witches find themselves picking up all kinds of shimmering things to embellish their witchy nests. From material objects like decks and books, to all manner of different practices and areas of study. They tend to become overwhelmed and lack direction, trying to fit too many things into a stuffed spiritual framework that's bursting with excitement but lacking real substance. Let's have a look at some of the key symptoms of mystical magpie syndrome. You have a jam-packed spiritual schedule that's unrealistic and exhausting. You keep purchasing new things without consistently using what you already have. You often leave witchy books half read, forget about them and start reading new ones. You're overwhelmed and confused by all the different practices you're excited about. You often change the labels you apply to yourself or never feel happy with how your witchcraft is going. You keep making strong starts with different practices, deities or areas of study, but nothing lasts beyond a few weeks. Other witches always seem to have a more desirable or interesting practice than you. And that's where it's all got to be kind of stripped back, made simple, you know, relax. Don't tell yourself that there's any sense of a loss of legitimacy from doing that. Hey there, Sunbeams. It's now time for me to talk a little bit about my sponsor, Skillshare. I always wanted to be a member because Skillshare is just such a nurturing platform with so many different uh, courses on there that really speak to who I am as a human being. The course that I want to recommend this time around is Designing the Life You Want by Michelle B. It's four exercises for clarity and motivation. I really loved this one, not least because I was looking for something a little bit different to what I've seen out there in the clarity and motivation space before. And Michelle really provided, I absolutely love one of the particular segments of the course. Uh, the lesson is called Creating Your Anti-Vision. And actually it's quite shadow worky as far as exercises go. It's exactly what it says on the tin. She advises you to go in there and really create the vision of what you don't want to bring into your life. And I thought that was very different. I don't see a lot of people encouraging that kind of thing. So I really wanted to put this forward to you as something that you might want to try. Um, I think that Skillshare is just so worthwhile. And so it's why it's uh, the only sponsor I've ever, ever said yes to. If you're one of the first 1000 people to click the link in my description, you will be given a free one month premium subscription for Skillshare. Uh, so, you know, don't take it from me. Find out for yourself. Enjoy this course that I've recommended today and so many others in the realm of creativity, you know, filmmaking, writing, illustration, life advice, you know, home decoration, all different kinds of things. There's baking courses in there. Um, so, yeah, go ahead and 
click my link. It really helps me out when you do that. It helps the channel when you do that. And just go ahead and enjoy all the goodness that is on offer with Skillshare. Let's get back to the video. Okay, the fourth tip I've got for you if you're struggling with consistency and you keep dropping your practice is ask yourself where are your self-imposed limitations when it comes to how you can practice and when you can practice. Um, one big thing I want to mention here is do you tell yourself you always should be practicing outside? You know, because that's going to have its limitations at times. Do you, tell, do you tell yourself you always need to be practicing at your altar because that's going to have its limitations at times? We should be able to switch up the location without feeling like, oh, this isn't right. I should be out in nature. I should be amongst the trees or I should be inside. I should have my stuff. I should have my book of shadows. I should have all my candles. Like we should be able to take our power with us everywhere. And I know this video is not just for witches. I'm not trying to make it too overly witchcraft centric, but in any in any way in which you usually tell yourself, I need to be in my spiritual space, wherever that is, just question that gently. Just question, do I really need to be in my spiritual space? Or is this my spiritual space right here, wherever I am? You know, I'm going to pull young you. It's like wherever I lay my hat, that's my home. Okay. Um, so, take a, some time to think about whether or not you are imposing that limitation on yourself. Are you imposing limitations on yourself in relation to how much sleep you needed to have had or how much, um, you know, how much time something is going to take to do? Because honestly, one way in which a lot of people create inconsistency in their practice is by saying, well, I'd need a couple of hours to do that. Um, I'd need a, I'd need the whole of the rest of the, of the day off to do that. Or I'd need to have slept a full night and then have a day off or then whatever. And I think people tell themselves that they can't make their spiritual practice a little bit more quick and dirty and grab it while they can. I mean, yeah, it's always beautiful to be able to carve out the time for a really deep retreat or a really long meditation or a really, you know, beautiful long ritual, definitely. But that's not always the way of it. And there is no need for you to stop dead in the water just because you can't get that kind of time or you feel you can't reach that kind of quality that you're looking for before you start. Sometimes that's actually a form of self-sabotage to convince yourself that you require a certain level of quality, which is actually going to be evading you. You're not going to be able to get that high caliber of like free time or whatever it is you're looking for, the house being empty. You're not going to be able to get that. And so it almost becomes a little bit of a a form of self-sabotage that you're not going to practice at all unless you can practice with it being absolutely perfect, absolutely quiet. I've got all day off. I'm not doing anything else. You know, often we're not going to have that. Often we are not going to have that. So we have to allow our spiritual practice to fit around us. So where are you imposing limitations there? And I think also people impose limitations on themselves when it comes to things like waiting for the full moon, for example, um, to do a particular spell. Now, sometimes that will feel really right and you know that it's going to take place on the full moon or the dark moon or whatever the case may be. Or you know, being a sort of astro-oriented person, you know that there's a specific time where specific things Things need to happen. And that's absolutely fine. I'm not telling you that that paradigm is wrong, that that attitude is wrong. But I would ask you if you feel trapped by it and if it is stopping you sometimes from just simply getting into doing a spiritual practice because you feel like it in that moment. And you're not even, you don't even know what the moon phase is. You just know it's time for spiritual practice. And so you just do it, you know, let's not feel entrapped by uh, calendars and systems and stuff like that. Let's also just get it in whenever we can and whenever we feel called. I have definitely had lots of clients and lots of audience members tell me that they planned out this big thing and they were waiting for the full moon and on the night of the full moon something came up or the babysitter let them down or they fell asleep because they were too tired or they clean forgot about it um, and so they waited all that time and they planned and planned and then actually the full moon just wasn't on their mind in that moment or something else came up so I feel like sometimes it's just good to strike while the iron's hot and while you've got that well, you've got that sense within you that it's now, I feel the passion now, I feel the intensity now, I feel the desire to do this work now, whatever it might be, whether it's spellcraft, whether it's shadow work, whatever it is you're doing, you know, sometimes we can't wait for a uh, little Miss Luna to come around and be 
exactly as we need her to be you know uh, sometimes we just have to to go for it can i just say that i'm in no way trying to imply that if you feel really ill and you haven't been sleeping and you feel like crap that you should be doing really in-depth really intense spiritual practices so please don't don't read me wrongly there i'm not saying that i'm just saying that people delay sometimes because everything isn't perfect and things don't need to be perfect around you to be working on your spiritual path a lot of the time we maintain our connection to spirituality because things are not perfect and because we are grappling with pain and confusion and difficulties coming left right and center and we want to have a spiritual toolkit so really in no way are we trying to um, see our lives as perfect so why would we want to wait for perfection in order to do the spiritual practices that are going to toughen us up for the imperfect lives we're leading as humans you know, it just doesn't, something doesn't add up there. Tip number five that I want to give you, this is more of something to observe in your own life if you haven't already. I know that for some people, you're going to be well aware that this is part of the issue uh, of why you're struggling with consistency. But I think for a lot of people, it also won't be. And, I, and hopefully this will be a penny drop for you as well. Sometimes external pressure or the feeling of external discouragement is going to be a part of the problem. Obviously, for some people, you live with others who do not agree with what you're doing spiritually. They don't approve of it. They don't like the fact that you're in your room doing yoga or meditation or tarot or whatever it is you're doing. Um, you know, so you have to hide it from them or you have to downplay it around them or you just do not feel comfortable with the energy in the home because you know that the energy of the people in the home is not receptive to what it is that you're trying to do in this really sincere, really deep way. And I can tell totally understand why that would make you struggle with consistency. A hundred percent. That does make sense. I think sometimes the external hostility and discouragement towards practices, spiritual practices, is less obvious. So sometimes, for example, you might have a partner who just gets a little bit huffy when you say that you're going to go to your room and do spiritual stuff. It's almost as though they, they don't understand why you would prioritise it over sitting with them after dinner or doing something with them. They don't understand why you would ever want to go off and do that when you could be in the real world with this real person who loves you, you know? And I think that's something that you can have a conversation about. There are some situations where you're not going to be able to have a conversation and you're going to have to have a hidden altar in a drawer somewhere until you move out from your present situation. And I really feel for people in that situation and it will get better and you will be able to be more expressive with your spiritual freedom um you know and keep on keeping on and be strong and you're already strong enough as it is if you're surrounded by people who are you know saying certain things to you about what you're doing or who you are or you can't even reveal to them that you practice certain things because it would just be a complete shit show you are already strong enough for just watching this video and taking on these tips you know and i commend you and my heart goes out to you i think for other people there can be a conversation to be had where it's like look this is important to me i know you don't understand it but it is important for me and it helps me and it's something that I'm going to continue doing. So please, you know, try not to take that attitude about it. I'm not going to be up there all night. But yes, I'm going up there to do some stuff. And I would like to not be disturbed. You know, sometimes it's just about setting that boundary, communicating that you're feeling that the energy is low when you say you're going to go and do something of the spiritual persuasion and, and saying that that makes you feel uncomfortable to do something that you love doing and have that conversation, you know? I'd love to hear in the comments down below, are you living with people who are hostile towards your spiritual practice? Are you now only just realizing that you are struggling with the hostility around your practice? Maybe you're even just realizing that no one in your life is being hostile towards your practice, but you just feel that the wider society around you doesn't approve of it and that's making it difficult for you. If you are trying to bring up your spiritual beliefs and your spiritual practices with people in your life whom you know don't approve, you don't need to do that. You don't need their approval. You don't need their validation. I know it's really, really hard when all you want is for people to understand that you're not a bad person for doing the things that you're doing and that it's not harming you and it won't harm them. But honestly, some conversations are 
really like having a conversation with a brick wall. And if you know that's what you've been doing, I would really recommend that you can serve your energy. Um, you know, and I will leave a couple of videos down below for those who specifically have come out of a Christian tradition or a Christian upbringing and you are struggling with the aftermath of that. Uh, not that I have personal experience with this, but I've just worked with so many clients over the course of time um, who I would say are really dealing with, with uh, some of the elements of religious trauma syndrome, which I think should be added to the diagnostic handbook immediately. I think it's absolutely a real fucking thing. Um, and uh, I've seen it. I've, 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 heard, you know, over and over again. I'm going to put something out about this. I mean it. I'm going to make a big project where I collect together the stories of witches and mystics and spiritual people who have come out from under that umbrella and actually managed to forge a spiritual path for themselves. Because I think that is incredibly strong, and I find that very impressive. Um, it's a really, really hard thing to do. So sometimes I would just recommend, you know, your mental safety over and above anything else. Some conversations are gonna be so much more fruitful than others and only you can know which conversations it's worthwhile to have. I would say do what you can, keep what you can in your space, you know, without having, without, you know, inviting arguments about things and whatnot. Um, I'm certainly not saying be meek and mild and never stick up for yourself. Like if you want to stick up for your spiritual beliefs, go for it. Uh, but I just, I worry that there are a lot of people out there who just really want someone to understand and just to get that feeling that they can connect with that family member or that loved one, even though you have differences of opinion on spirituality and religion. And sometimes that's just not going to be the way and they're not going to budge. And that's not your fault. You have to really be able to use your spirituality to get you through this time, as opposed to trying to get them to understand where you're coming from. Um, so really bring the the bring the healing salve of your spiritual journey to yourself and, and do as much of it as you can internally. You know, you don't even have to own books or own decks or have an altar space if that's not going to be convenient for you right now for any reason. It's all in here. As I said at the beginning in my little intro piece, it's, it's, I don't need the things. It's all in here. Okay, honeybees, here is a little bit of tough love for the sixth tip that I have for you. Is it tip number six? Let me see. Yep, it is number six. Okay, this is a big one. This is a big one. A lot of people tell me, Kellyanne, there is nothing wrong with the design of my spiritual path. I love the idea of everything I want to do. And when I do it, I feel great. But I just don't do it a lot because I'm lazy. I just don't have the motivation. It must be laziness. I think about doing it. I think about how great it could be. And then I just don't do it. And I just like laze around. I just look on my phone, whatever. And then I regret it. And usually what comes out of these conversations and what I've observed is that people who are attacking themselves for being lazy, too lazy to have a spiritual practice, are often waiting for motivation to strike before they actually begin the practice, whatever the practice is. And this is definitely going to be the kiss of death. Definitely. It's the kiss of death with learning a language. It's the kiss of death with learning to drive. It's the kiss of death with learning an instrument. It's the kiss of death with a lot of different shit going to the gym. If we're waiting for motivation, it's going to be a non-starter because motivation is not always going to be there. Um, you know, it's so important that we have this higher awareness. I was going to say deeper awareness, but higher, deeper, whatever works for you. But basically this awareness that goes beyond whether or not we want to do it in that moment, we have to be connected to that sense that we want to do it overall and that actually we're going to do it whether motivation strikes or not. And for those people who are trying to figure out what is good for them in their practice, what works, what makes them feel really fizzy, what gets them really potent, what helps them with the issues they're having in life. The only way they can figure that out really is by doing something consistently and then checking the results. Like a scientist, you know, you start a practice of meditation, you have to do it regularly to see whether or not it's having any effect. You can't just do it twice and then not do it because you didn't feel motivated to do it for a whole number of days. You've got to keep doing it. And that means 
coming to the practice and being present with it, whether you feel necessarily motivated to or not. I guess I actually just don't have that much to say on this particular point, to be honest. It's literally short and sweet. Do not tell yourself that motivation needs to visit in order for you to sit down and do something spiritual or stand up and do something spiritual or however it works for you. Um, Because actually the motivation is not going to be there all the time. It just isn't. And I think we get this idea in our heads that for other people, the motivation is always there. And that is why they do so much, spiritually speaking. That's why they have these practices, you know, do this, do these trainings um, and really sort of see that progress. It's because they feel motivated, motivated, motivated. I don't believe so. I don't believe they always feel motivated, but they know that there is this, there is this higher deeper, more far reaching ripple of a reason why they would keep doing it. And a lot of it is about what I spoke to at the beginning of this um, video, when I discussed, um, you know, that, that your spiritual path is your training for when the shit hits the fan. Your spiritual path is something that not only um, you feel drawn to do, you feel moved to do, it might be feel natural to you, but also it's something in the toolkit for when life gets seriously fucking crunchy. And so that for me is one of the bigger reasons why I would uh, why I would come to things when I don't necessarily feel motivated to do so. Sometimes it's like taking medicine, isn't it? You know that you want to take the medicine because it will fortify you, it will make you feel better, um, it's made you feel better before, but you also don't really feel particularly motivated to get up and go and get the bottle and swallow the liquid and the liquid might not taste particularly great and it's like there's other things you want to do. It's really about making the decision that that medicine is going into you, whether you really feel ultimately motivated to go and get it and swallow it or not. Just just do it. Just do it, basically, I think is what I'm trying to say. The seventh and final tip that I have for you is that you may require some accountability of some kind. Sometimes it's really difficult to just carry on with a spiritual practice totally solo and you might want to actually just talk to somebody else who also has a solo spiritual practice. If there's nobody in your life like that, in the you know in the physical realm, you can totally do it online. You can join Facebook groups, you can join Discord, you know. Um, you can find that community of people who are doing, um, d- doing it and, and join them and, and talk about it, talk about issues you have with it, help other people with issues that they have and feel empowered in being able to do that. Uh, you might want to, um, you know, work with with a mentor, work with with someone who's going to give you training. Know that you've paid for a certification or a diploma or some kind of, um, you know, uh, some kind of further knowledge in one of the aspects of spirituality that you're fascinated by, and therefore you know you will keep coming back to it because you've paid to do the course. You know, anything like that where you get accountability, you feel like you're not completely on your own, and therefore able to kind of um, able to to let yourself down quite so easily. You've got some kind of structure in place. So find a group, start a group, you know, um, find a coven, find a friend who wants to be more consistent with their spiritual practice or indeed with anything else, as long as you can buddy up and exchange what's been going on and how it's been going. Anything like that would be really great. Um, or be really daring and start a channel or start a TikTok or start an Instagram and come and come and talk with the people who are being a little bit more forthright online about what is going on in their practice and be part of the discussion there. Um, There's different ways that you can do it. You know, you can hire a spiritual mentor that you know you speak to once a week or once a month for that accountability. Whatever it is you feel like you want to do to feel like you are not just left to your own devices all the time if you feel like that's gone a little bit wonky and you need to come back on track. Darlings, thank you so much for listening to these seven tips to help you to be more consistent and stay on track. I really hope that this was useful. I'm going to leave a few videos of mine down below, including another video that I made about consistency in spiritual practice. Um, I will leave down below the videos that I mentioned earlier for people coming out of um, an environment with Christian dogma. I'll also leave videos below about how to be a self-loving witch and also a Q&A that I did a while ago about witchy problems. So if you feel like you want to hear more from me about troubleshooting uh, witchy issues, then witchy woes, then you can definitely go and watch that. I'm also going to link a video by Thorn Mooney, which I actually have not watched yet. I've been planning to watch it today and I haven't watched it yet but it's called something like don't force yourself to have a practice every day. 
And I think that we probably all need to listen to that as well. That's a very, very good point. And I'm sure she's going to make it well because doesn't she always? So I'll leave that down below as well. Um, if you would like to have a reading or session with me specifically on this topic, I do a spiritual path reading. I do a, um, a uh, witchy brainstorming session where we can really get into what's going on for you with your witchcraft or spirituality. I've also got a solitary witch reading. So come along and have a look at those options. I will leave them down below. And don't forget that I have a card slinger circle workshop coming up on the 30th of April. So if you know that you need some accountability with the cards, if you are studying the cards, if you want to talk with other people about the cards and have a big community chat, if you want to draw some cards for yourself that will nurture you and help you figure out where to go next, but you also want to talk amongst a group about what those cards mean and also give your input on what other people's cards mean, come and get get sociable with us, you know, come and join in the fun. I will leave the link to the workshop down below. The Card Slinger Circle is always a joy. And I think the one on 30th of May, 30th of April, sorry, will be no exception. So please come along and check that out. Okay, much love for now, darlings, and blessed be. Mwah.